you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. There's the bell. We're going to be late. Aw, uh, so what? Last day before vacation. Yeah, but Fowler doesn't care. He'll mark us absent. Weird old guy, huh? Yeah. How did you do on the test? Me? I aced it. You did? <laughs> nah. Did you study? Well, I read all the pages, but I don't know. I don't get this poetry stuff. Why can't they just say what they mean? <coughs> <laughs> all right, class, let's begin. I trust you've brought your books. And that you have read the assignment. What's that? I can't hear you. Good, that's good. Now then, we've studied a number of poets this term, their themes and their methods, and we've analyzed their works, at least a sampling as time would allow. Is that correct? Today, I thought I'd talk about one of them, Alfred Edward Hausman. I'm sure you'll recall the name, born... What year, ah, uh, Mr. Graham? What year, sir? <laughs> Precisely the question. Well, sometime in the... the last century, I think? Close, Mr. Graham, closer than usual. Mr. Graham's career is laid out for him. After the varsity football team, he will be a second assistant in the information booth at Grand Central Station. <laughs> In the interests of time, let me refresh your memory. The date of A.E. Hausman's birth, Mr. Graham, and for the benefit of the rest of the class, was 1859, a long time ago. So long ago that it happened before our own civil war, in fact. I could, of course, ask you to tell me about the war between the states, but I choose not to press my luck any further. In any event, the subject of this class is literature, not history. His death occurred in what year, Mr. Butler? Well, I would say around... around 1900, sir? Upon my word, young Mr. Butler, it seems that you and Mr. Graham are kindred spirits. You are both masters of inexactitude. So allow me to enlighten you. Alfred Edward Hausman died in the year 1936. But we are concerned here with his achievements rather than the circumstances of his death. And perhaps his best-known work was A Shropshire Lad, which, of course, you know well by now, since it was part of your latest assignment. Nevertheless, I thought I might take it upon myself to read just a bit of it aloud. <coughs> When I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, Give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty. No use to talk to me. The heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. Tis paid with sighs of plenty and sold for endless rue. And I am two and twenty. And oh, tis true, tis true. True. This being the last afternoon of the semester, and this also being just three days before the Christmas holidays, I thought it might behoove me to show at least a minute degree of compassion and let you out early. I might add here that while your final exam papers are not ready to be returned, you have all, amazingly enough, passed. My delight is surpassed only by my sense of shock. It is rare, young men, that in some fifty-one years of teaching I have ever encountered such a class of dunderheads. But nice dunderheads, and potentially fine young men who will no doubt make their marks. And leave their marks. God bless you all, and a Merry Christmas. What you've just witnessed is not the end of a semester. It happens to be the end of an era. Professor Ellis Fowler, a teacher of literature, a gentle bookish guide to the young 
is about to find a package under his Christmas tree, and not a pleasant one. He doesn't realize it yet, but after half a century of planting seeds of wisdom and then watching the fruits of his harvest, he will discover that he has come to the end of the field and is about to be discarded, and that the campus of the Rock Hill School for Boys lies on a direct path to another institution commonly referred to as the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Changing of the Guard, starring Orson Bean with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Merry Christmas, Professor. And the same to you. Thanks. <laughs> yes, of course. See you next year. Yes, indeed, yes. Is that you, Fowler? Oh, good afternoon, Headmaster. Good afternoon to you. I say, Fowler, could you step into my office for a moment? Yes, yes, of course. It would be my pleasure. You received the midterm grades for my class, I take it? I did. Something else I can do for you? Some question, perhaps? Please, sit down. Be comfortable. Thank you, I will. You don't mind if I smoke, do you? Uh, by all means. I smoked a pipe for many years. I still love the fragrance of a good aromatic blend. Like spice on the air. Sometimes I think that's what I miss most, the aroma. It makes a room feel lived in. Quite right. At least for those who can tolerate tobacco these days. <laughs> of course, yes. Am I keeping you? What? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, there is going to be a broadcast of The Messiah at five o'clock. Is there? But I have plenty of time. It's a lovely piece, don't you think? It certainly is. Always very Yule-like. I agree. I agree. Well, then. I suppose we should get to the matter at hand. Uh, very well. This won't take long. Of course not. You're looking very well these days. Thank you, sir. I had a bit of a head cold, but it seems to have passed. Happens every winter. <laughs> and you? What? Oh, the flu bug seems to have passed me by. Knock wood. Huh, well, that's something to be thankful for, isn't it? You, uh... You didn't respond to the letter. I didn't? The one that the trustee sent you last week. Letter? I, I'm terribly sorry, Headmaster. It suddenly occurs to me that I haven't opened my mail the last few weeks. No? You know how it is. Final exams, grading, preparation for the holiday, that sort of thing. Though I am rather certain I know the contents of this particular letter. And, uh... Your reactions, Professor? Well, naturally, I'll go along. Well, I think that's very perspicacious of you, Professor. Then I'll tell the trustees that you received the communication and agreed to it. Now, as to your replacement... I told my housekeeper not a week ago that I should very likely teach in this place until I'm a hundred years old. And with great pleasure, I might add. Professor... Did you know, two years ago, I actually taught the grandson of one of my earliest students. Can you imagine the satisfaction that gave me? A sense of, oh, I don't know, not completion exactly, but accomplishment, perhaps, in some small measure. I venture to say that I'll live to teach a great-grandson one of these days. Please, if you'll... It was the Reynolds boy. You know him, I'm sure. His father was Damon Reynolds, and his grandfather, a regular rascal of a boy who persisted in calling me Weird Beard. Didn't know I knew that's what he was calling me. <laughs> oh, a regular rascal of a boy went into the stock market, made himself a fortune, came back for his 20th reunion, shook my hand and said, actually said to me, Professor Fowler, please... Forgive me for calling you Weird Beard. <laughs> Isn't that remarkable? <clears throat> Professor Fowler, you'll forgive me, sir, but I think you'd best read the communication that the trustees sent. Oh, indeed I will, though it's really an odd formality, this contract signing year after year. You can tell them for me, headmaster, old Fowler won't depart the ship. Oh, no, indeed. He'll stand at the wheel through fair weather and foul and watch the crews come aboard and then depart, come aboard and depart as they always have. Professor Fowler, please hear me out. Yes, was there something else? communication that the trustees sent you was not a contract, 
Not this time. As a matter of fact, it was a notice of termination. What? You've been on the faculty here for over 50 years. 50 remarkable years, I might add. You passed the normal retirement age several years ago. So you see, we decided at our winter meeting that perhaps a somewhat younger man... You don't mean to say... If you could have been at the meeting, sir, you would have been very proud of the things said about you and your work. A teacher of incalculable value to all of us. But... But youth must be served. Changing of the guard, that sort of thing. I'm sure you can appreciate my position. Mr. Headmaster, am I to understand that my contract is not to be renewed? I'm discharged? Discharged? Please, don't call it that. Retirement. And at half salary for the rest of your life. For the rest of my life? A chance to do the things you've waited for. Hobbies, writing, the opportunity to publish. Think of the books, the articles. Well, it, it most certainly proves one thing. Upon my word, it does. A man should read his mail. He most certainly should read his mail. Boys. Merry Christmas, Professor. Why? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, have a happy holiday, sir. Very kind of you, very, very kind indeed, and the very best to you boys, to both of you. See you after Christmas, sir. Mr. Halliday, Mr. McTavish, I wish you a safe journey and a happy reunion with your families, and I trust you will not eat too much turkey or, 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 or too, much, too much stuffing. <laughs> we'll try not to, sir. They're fine, young men. Have a Merry Christmas, both of you. Have a... <sighs> Excuse me, I, I must be going. What's the matter with old Weird Beard? He was crying. Did you see that? No. Not him. Yeah, he was. He was crying. Letter. A letter, he says. Of all the... Oh, Mr. Fowler, I, I was worried about you. Huh? It's later than usual. I, I didn't hear you come in. Oh, that's all right. I had my key. Why have you left the door open? Sorry. Everything all right, Mr. Fowler? Here it is. What, Mrs. Landers, am I all right? I, I guess that would depend upon the point of view, wouldn't it? If you're a trustee in this institution, anxious to inject new young blood into the faculty, I'm sure you'd think there was nothing wrong, nothing wrong at all. What are you talking about? But if you're an old man who has spent the better part of his life inside those walls, those classrooms, then you might be forgiven a degree of consternation. <laughs> As a matter of fact, everything is not all right. Everything happens to be very wrong. What is it, Professor? What's wrong? See for yourself. Here, I'll read it to you and... Uh, so forth, so on, so on. And since it is the policy of the school to ensure our students the most up-to-date educational methods, we think it advisable that you consider this retirement to be a mutually beneficial decision. Please understand the spirit in which this request is made and understand further that your contributions to Rock Hill School for Boys are a matter of record, as is our appreciation. Oh, my word, Professor, that means... That means, Mrs. Landers, stripped of its sophistry, its subtlety, its effort to break the news gently in so many words, I've been given the sack. But there must be some mistake. None of my boys were here, were they? Your boys? The students. They had a wonderful tradition that went on for many years. On the last afternoon of the winter term, they would gather outside, just there, beyond the window, and sing Christmas carols. I came to expect it after a while. They haven't done that in years, Professor. Not since before the war, as I recall. Of course, I should have remembered. I've become a worshipper of tradition, Mrs. Landis. A worshipper of tradition and a fervent follower of ritual. I, I know it now. I know it and I can admit it. I guess that's why this whole thing has taken me by surprise. Can I... 
get you anything, anything at all? I'm an antique guarding antiques. I am the curator of a museum that houses nothing but some very fragile memories. Professor, you're the finest man. You're absolutely the finest man. And you, Mrs. Landers, have been the most wonderful housekeeper a man could wish for. Now, could you do me one small favor? Anything at all. Could you possibly brew me up a pot of tea? Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Would you mind terribly? Handel's Messiah is on the radio in a few minutes. I'd like to listen to it. I'll bring it right in, sir. Professor? What is it? You'll be all right for a few minutes. Don't be silly. I'm fine. I think I'll sit here and read the rest of my mail until then. It'll be just a moment. I'll be right back. Of course you will. And we're almost ready for our annual symphony broadcast of the air, bringing you these performances live and uninterrupted has become a tradition here in the country. Good, good, another minute. I'll have an opportunity to prepare. There. Now I believe I'm quite ready. Yes, Mrs. Landers? Come in. Oh, I thought you were asleep, Professor. Not at all. I was listening to the performance. Magnificent, as always. Would you care for some more tea? Thank you, no. Well, I'll have dinner ready in a half hour. Why don't you take a little nap? I know I'm being very difficult, but could we put off dinner this evening? I haven't much of an appetite. You've got to eat something, Professor. Perhaps later. I could keep it warm for you. Why don't you rest for a while? Oh, I don't know that I feel like resting. Not just yet. As you wish. Do you happen to know... Yes, Professor? Where I've kept the yearbooks. The yearbooks? From the school? They haven't been packed away in the attic, have they? Why, no, I, I don't believe so. Check the corner bookcase. Yes, here they are. Oh, good. Did you want to see one in particular? No, it doesn't matter. So many years summarized here, encapsulated, as it were, as if these books were in some sense time machines. This volume, for instance. Look at their faces. Timothy Arnold. Never thought that one would pass. Had an incorrigible habit of chewing bubble gum and popping it. Sounded like a small howitzer in the back of the room. Upon <laughs> my word, it did. Why don't you sit down? No, no. And William Hood, little Bill Hood, smallest boy ever to play varsity football here. Believe it or not, he had a penchant for the poems of Shelley. Did he? And Artie Beechcroft. Now there was a lad. There was a staunch lad full of heart, that one. What a face. Was he the one... Yes, yes, I recall now. His father sent me a letter. I wonder if I still have it. He was killed in Iwo Jima. Freckle-faced little fellow, always grinning. Never stopped grinning, most infectious. He'd walk into a classroom and you simply had to smile. Let me put it back for you. They come and go like ghosts. Faces, names, smiles, the funny things they did, or sad things, or silly ones, or noble ones. And I... Gave them nothing. Oh, Mr. Fowler. But it's true, don't you see? I gave them nothing at all to protect them from the world. I realize that now. Poetry that left their minds as soon as they left the school. Aged slogans and homilies that were already out of date when I repeated them. Quotations so dear to me that were meaningless to them. Surely not. I was a failure, Mrs. Landers. I was an old relic that walked from class to class, speaking by rote to unhearing ears, unwilling heads. I was a dismal, abject failure. I motivated no one. I left no imprint. Now, where do you suppose I got the idea that I was accomplishing anything? How could I have thought that? Oh, Mr. Fowler. I will take that nap now, and I hope I haven't inconvenienced you putting off our dinner like this. You haven't. You haven't done anything of the kind. I'll straighten up for you. 
Don't bother. There's nothing on my desk of any importance. Dear, dear Mr. Fowler. Oh, of course I'll straighten up for you. The least I can do. It would be my pleasure. <gasps> What's this? Bullets. And an empty holster. Empty? Professor? Professor, are you in your room? Professor, are you out there? Where have you gone? Oh, oh. Hello. The headmaster, please. Quickly. Well, it's about Professor Fowler. Hello? Yes? Who's that? It's Alice Fowler. Hello, Tom. Oh, hello, Professor. Working late, are you? No, no, just out for a walk. And, and you, you should be home yourself, Tom. I will be soon enough. A few chores before I lock up for the holidays. Nothing too serious, I trust. Oh, the door to the main building. The latch is sprung so it won't lock. Can't leave it like that. I suppose not. Can you fix it? Strike plate needs tightening, that's all. I was on my way to get my tools. Well, you shouldn't have much to worry about here. The boys of Rock Hill are hardly vandals. No, but there's the matter of security. Files, records. The real treasures of this school are invisible to the eye. How do you mean? The minds that were formed here, for better or worse. The personalities that grew to maturity and then went out into the world. Well, you're one guy who had a lot to do with that. Precious little, I'm afraid. Precious little. But even if the school made little impression on them, they surely left their impression on it. These walls could talk, huh, Professor? Yes, indeed, if these walls could talk. Getting pretty cold. Better button up that coat. Oh, I don't have far to go. Where are you headed? To the statue in the courtyard. You can see it just ahead. Oh, yeah. You know, I always wondered who that guy was, anyway. Somebody famous, I bet. It's a bronze of Horace Mann, the educator. The old fellow looks rather foreboding, doesn't he? But, you know, when I first began here as an instructor, I liked to take my lunches in this courtyard, in his shadow, so to speak, as if in some way I might be inspired by him. At least, that was my thought. Well, guess I better get those tools. Yes, yes, of course. This is as far as I go. Take care of yourself, Professor. I will, and Tom... What? I just wanted to say... Yeah? To thank you for taking such good care of the grounds all these years, and for this conversation. I've enjoyed it. Me too, Professor. You take care now. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, too. Horace Mann, 1796-1859. I was just wondering, Mr. Mann, I was wondering if you had any self-doubts. I'm sure not. All one had to do was read the inscription, Be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Well said. But, you see, Mr. Man, I have won no victory. No victory at all. And now, sorry to say, I am ashamed to die. Class bells at this hour? Why would they ring now? There's no special assembly. There's nothing of the sort this evening. Master. I came as quickly as I could. Thank you. Not at all, Mrs. Landis. I didn't know who else to call. Have you found Professor Fowler? Not a word. I'll contact the local authorities. If they see him... He couldn't have gone far. I'm afraid I must bear some responsibility for this. Oh, the professor doesn't blame you. Of course, he wouldn't. It's not in his nature. But perhaps if I had handled it differently... He should have been included in the board's deliberations. I want you to know that it was a most difficult decision. Most difficult. Well, the only thing that matters now is to find him. They say there will be more snow tonight. Can you think of where he might have gone? Into town, perhaps, to visit a friend? He doesn't go anywhere except the school. It's been his life. Then I'll alert campus security. 
Though it's unlikely he's there, everything will be closed now for the holidays. There's something I haven't told you. Yes? He... He has a gun with him. What? An old army souvenir. It belonged to his father. It's gone from his desk drawer. And so are the bullets. Old Tom hasn't repaired the door yet. But why is the class bell ringing? There are no classes at this hour. What is the meaning of this? Come in, Professor. We've been waiting for you. What, what are you boys doing in my classroom? We're here to see you, sir. I... I don't quite understand. Forgive me, boys, but I'm not at all sure what I mean is I don't recollect how... Artie Beechcroft, sir. Second form, class of 41. How have you been, Professor? How's that? How's that again? You say you're Artie Beechcroft? Yes, sir. Of course you are. I'd recognize you anywhere. And I'd recognize you, sir. You've hardly changed. Why, Artie, I'm delighted to see you. I'm truly delighted to see you. I've thought of you many times over the years, and I've missed your presence. And I've missed you, too. But what are you doing here? Forgive me, but you shouldn't be here at all. If memory serves, weren't you... That's right, Professor. I was killed in the Battle of Iwo Jima. One of this nation's proudest hours. I wanted to show this to you. What do you have there? It's the Congressional Medal of Honor. Splendid. It was given to me posthumously, sir. My father was very proud. Oh, my, and a very prideful thing it is, Mr. Beechcroft, a very prideful thing. And I am indeed proud of you, too. Thank you, sir. That means a great deal to me, more than you know. You were always a fine young man, a fine young man, but I don't understand. How can you be... Professor? What? What's that? It's Bartlett. Third form. I died in Roanoke, Virginia. I was doing research on x-ray treatment for cancer. You were? I was exposed to an overdose of radioactivity and contracted leukemia myself. Such a sacrifice, Bartlett, a terrible price to pay. But think of how many people have benefited from your efforts, your courage. Perhaps a few, sir. I hope so. I remember, Bartlett. I do remember. I read about it. That was a brave thing you did. An incredibly brave thing. I kept remembering, Professor. Something you'd said to me. A quote from a poet named Walter. Yes, Howard Arnold Walter, wasn't it? He said, I would be true, for there are those who trust me. I would be pure, for there are those who care. I would be strong, for there is much to suffer. I would be brave, for there is much to dare. I never forgot that, Professor. It was something you left me. I never forgot. How, how very decent of you, Butler, to say that. That's why I brought the medal to show you, Professor Fowler. Yes, Mr. Beechcroft? Because it's partly yours. Not at all. It is. You taught me about real courage. You taught me what it meant. Why, why, how incredible. Professor? Why, why, it's Weiss, isn't it? Dickie Weiss. You were the first one, Dick, to, to... The first one to die in World War II, Professor. I was an ensign at Pearl Harbor on the Arizona. Yes, you were. I remember you, Dick. It was in all the papers and on the radio. You saved a dozen men. I did my best, sir. You certainly did. Got them out of a boiler room after they were trapped and lost your own life doing it. You were at my elbow that day, Professor. What? You may not have known it, but you were. But why... It was a poem you taught me by John Donne. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Thompson, sir. Second form. Class of 39. I died on New Guinea, but you taught me about patriotism. Rice, sir. Third form. I died in the Battle of the Bulge. You taught me about duty, about never giving up against impossible odds. Hudson, sir. Second form. Class of 1951. I did my service in Korea. You taught me about loyalty. Whiting, sir. Fourth form. Class of 53. I became a civil rights attorney. You taught me about ethics 
and honesty. I... I'm overwhelmed. We have to go back now. So soon, Auntie? I'm sorry, Professor. Go where? To the place where we belong. But we wanted to let you know that we were grateful. That we are forever grateful. And that each of us has in turn carried with him something you gave us. Something that lives and will not die. Not ever. We wanted to thank you, Professor. Yes, thank you. We won't forget. Take care, Professor. Take good care. You don't know how much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Must you go so soon, please? Can't you stay a little bit longer? Artie, Artie, I'm reminded of another poem by Shelley, if I can recall. It goes like this. Peace. Peace. He is not dead. He does not sleep. He has awakened from the dream of life. Yes, Headmaster, he's home now. Well, I wanted to call and let you know. Yes, he's all right. Yes, he's just fine. Thank you. Sorry about the misunderstanding. Merry Christmas to you, too. Do you hear that, Mrs. Landers? The carolers came this year after all. And a lovely sound it is. Lovely and joyous. Thank you, boys. I enjoyed your performance very much, very much indeed. Merry Christmas, Professor. A Merry Christmas to you. And a Merry Christmas to you, young man. A very Merry Christmas. And may I add how grateful I am to all of you. I've always felt that Christmas caroling is, is a wonderfully special tradition. Merry Christmas, boys, and may God bless you. Such fine young men. That they are. They haven't come in such a long time. You know, Mrs. Landers, I've had a chance to consider. I think I will retire. I do believe I've taught all that I can teach. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. In any event, I wouldn't want the returns to diminish. Well then, if that's your decision, I think you've made the right one. I'm sure you have. So am I, Mrs. Landers. So am I. I hope so. Because, you see, I do believe, I do believe that I may have left my mark, such as it was. A few gauntlets of knowledge I've thrown out that may have been picked up here and there after all. Be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. I didn't win them myself, but perhaps I helped others to win them. So in that way, even in some small measure, they are victories that I can share. I'm sure that's so. I've had a good life, Mrs. Landers. A very rich life. A very fruitful life. And as for this particular changing of the guard, I wouldn't have it any other way. We wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. Professor Ellis Fowler, teacher, who discovered, rather belatedly, something of his own value. That the quality of a man's life is not measured by his personal achievements, but rather in the effect he has on the lives he touches and the contribution he makes to humanity, one that lives on long after he reaches the end of his tenure. A very small scholastic lesson, but an exceedingly important one, from the campus of the Twilight Zone. Back to the Twilight Zone after these words. You are about to enter another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663.
The Changing of the Guard, starring Orson Bean with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Komenik, Alyssa Fraden, Brooke Reed, Kyle Tequila, Chad Reinhardt, Joe Sherman, Justin Chiloa, Doug James, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Don Longo, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>